All right. Beginning in verse number one. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Thank you. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become its saints. For this you know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Together, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Amen. Father, thank you for the word of God where it's right by itself. We thank you, Lord God, and we purpose to align ourselves with your word. We thank you, Lord, because your word is eternal truth. Thank you, Father. Let it be made plain to us again. Strengthen every believer in the name of Jesus Christ. Open the word to us as we bring it forth. Give illumination, Lord, so that our hearts can grasp what you're saying to us today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Um, last Sunday we talked, uh, began to talk a bit about Ephesians, uh, this epistle, and uh, which is the epistle that written by Paul to the church. And uh, if we are looking to understand the purpose of, for the church, then we will find it in the book of Ephesians. If we want to understand the head, Christ, then we can go to the book of Colossians. 
and we can understand and there are truths that are written there to help us understand God's purpose. So the church is Christ's body and God's instrument to confound and overthrow evil powers. I'm going to say it again. The church is Christ's body and God's instrument to confound and overthrow evil powers. The church. Somebody say the church. God's purpose for the call out group, its purpose and intent is to form a body to express Christ's fullness on earth, according to 1, 15 through 23, and also to do this by uniting one people, both Jew and non-Jew alike, among whom he himself dwells right in the midst. And the third part, his intent is to equip, empower, and mature this people, the church, to extend Christ's victory over evil. Jesus Christ defeated Satan, and he took back the authority that God originally gave to humankind, Adam, before he fell, and so he took it back, and now he is the head of the redeemed race. Adam was the head of the human race, but now Christ is the head of the redeemed race. And as head, um, whatever is in Christ belongs to us. We find that in Adam, when Adam sinned, all of us sinned. That was terrible, right? Whether we liked it or not, because we were out from the head of the human race, all of us were considered sinners. But the good news is Christ, the head of the redeemed race, he pleased completely the Father. And since he pleased completely the Father, we are in him. So God is pleased with his redeemed race. So, uh, because of Christ, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ, God is pleased with us. So, we stay united with him. And every blessing that God intends for us down here on earth will come. We stay united with him, right? Of all, uh, one of the, the key words, two words, in the book of Ephesians, marks the theme of this book is in Christ or in him. So everything, all the blessings are resident in him because of what he has done. And Ephesians unfolds the process by which God is bringing the church to his destined purpose in Christ. This book unfolds the process, Ephesians. So step by step, it talks about the process, threefold process. Um, first, there's the, the stand, our stand, and he talks about uh, who we are and, you know, what God has done through redemption. Then it talks about his walk. That's the second aspect of um, um, this process. One understanding who we are, and our stand, our position in God is very important before we can walk effectively and successfully. If I don't really know who I am, then I don't know what I got going for me, right? So I'm, uh, so I'm bringing back now the importance of, uh, I'll briefly talk about the stand. We talked a little about it last week. This week, I will reiterate a little bit. But again, I say, uh, um, the uh, Ephesians unfolds the process by which God is bringing the church into his destined purpose in Christ. When Christ defeated Satan, he is still defeated, but he's not locked up. He's still roaming the earth. And all of these demons that were a part of his original kingdom 
are there to do his work. But we are to play the role, his body, in finishing through him the work and further overthrowing the evil powers that still lurk in Rome to hinder God's people, all right? So there's a process in doing that. We said first, we must know who we are. We must know what God has done for us. And then after we understand to a large degree what Christ has done for us, who we are, our position as sons of God, as the redeemed, then it's time to learn how to walk consistent with who we really are. You with me? That's what this book teaches. And then finally, the third is engaging in spiritual warfare and winning through Christ. So um, I remember uh, my wife sharing how um, God told her, don't go uh, where I haven't prepared you. So he was saying, don't try to delve into warfare if I haven't prepared you. If you don't have the knowledge and understanding then in the preparation, then you cannot go into certain areas in warfare. So now, as I said, he's got it all lined up. So as we read it and study it, we can begin to see uh, God's purposes here. So uh, as he's defeated Satan, he wants him to remain defeated in our individual and collective lives. Make sense? And that's what he wants uh, from you and I. Uh, sometimes when we look at Satan, we feel like he is so strong and so bad and, and all of these things, so we give him more credit than we should be giving him. But after we understand what God has done for us and where we sit in the position of authority, it changes our perception and perspective as Christians. So what are you saying, Brother Heron? We've got to go into it now. We'll talk a bit more about the chosen. But this whole book, six chapters, is divided into two parts. There's a position, our position, which is the first three chapters, and the other three chapters deal with the practice. Every time God gives doctrine, he gives practice. He does not give us doctrine, and then there's no um, expectation. There's no responsibilities. There's no privileges without responsibility. Everybody with me? I want you to look at your neighbor and say, kindly wake up a little bit. Do we need to stand up and stretch a little bit or something? I don't want us to, you know, act like we're in a funeral, you know, because uh, this, is, this is a place where we worship and give glory unto the great king of the ages, you know, and he's a good God. Kayla, it's so good to have you back. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. You're looking well. You're looking healthy. Basic training has done you well. <laughs> Come on, give God a hand for Kayla. God is good. We thank him. He's so good to us. And um, uh, with saints, we can't wait until everything looked victorious, right? We, we, we got to learn to do that before it happens, right? Now, now the just, now the just shall live. Now you mean the just shall live by experience. Now the just shall live by how they feel. Oh. Well, the just really shall live by what they see. By what they understand, you mean. <laughs> well, that kind of puts a, sheds another light on it, right? So what that means, 
I'm, I'm deviating from what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> so what that mean now? I can't. Okay. If I walk by faith, then when it doesn't look all right, it's still all right. And since it's still all right, as I give him praise, I'm saying I believe you. I believe that in the integrity of your word, right? When I praise him with a sincere heart, I'm saying God can be trusted. But when I don't praise him, I get frustrated since I don't feel like praising him today. Nobody's right there, but anyway, you, you know. God is so good. He is so great. He is so good. And let me tell you what a little of what he has done for us. Okay. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, he has chosen us. Somebody say chosen. He's adopted us. Somebody say adoption. He's accepted us. He's forgiven us. He's predestined us. He's sealed us. All right, now let me slowly go back through that again. Because there's nobody jumping and running around the building. <laughs> the Bible says he has chosen us. Means to pick out or choose for one's self. God did this for us. Now, look, he, he didn't see all this niceness in us when he chose us. He chose us. It was, the Bible says it was by his grace. It was by what was in him that prompted him to choose us. So everything was done because he is so full of mercy. And grace. So he looks at a fallen creation. He sees the struggle that they will, that will be endless unless God does something to help. And out of the beauty of his grace, he chooses us. He has such foresight. He can see thousands of years in the future and he, and he knows every response of humankind. And, and he, he said, for those that will believe when this gospel is preached, I'm predetermining, marking out their future. So your future is marked out by God. All you have to do is keep in step with what he's saying to you and live by the book, right? Live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Every spiritual blessing the Bible says he is given that we uh, have received every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. So the truth about you is this, and the truth about me, that we are so blessed. We are so blessed. So now before... I will commit to living for God with my whole heart. It is very important that I understand what God has done for me out of the abundance of his wonderful grace and kindness. 
There was nothing good in me, nothing good in you. It was out of him that this happened. Isn't that right? So the response is, I must be grateful. I must express gratitude for what this grace has done for you and I. Can we just give him some praise? He is worthy. He is a worthy. So that's why the Bible talks about wisdom is the principal thing. It is just plain wisdom to be grateful when somebody does you this kind of favor, right? So as I live it, as you live each day, I respond with gratitude. That's why we can get up in the morning and say, God, I thank you for this day. I've never seen this day before, but my eyes are open. I have cognizance, uh, uh, awareness. Uh, I'm here. I have use and activity of all my being. And, I, and it's time to give you praise again. So I thank you, Lord. And so it's thankfulness, which is a part of wisdom so I praise him I praise him I thank him because what he has done doesn't change the process of my learning experientially may change I may go from glory to glory I may learn more and more and more as the years go by but what he has done for me remains the same. Isn't that right? And the more I grow, the more grateful I am. Are you with me? Now, if by chance, 10 years ago, I'm still struggling with gratitude, that means my growth is very small. But if I have learned to be grateful to God when things don't feel right, don't look right, don't seem like right, I cannot understand it with my finite mind, then I'm learning I have grown a little bit more to understand that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He said, I am the Lord and I change not. He has redeemed us. Somebody said redeemed us. Hallelujah. So the fact that he's redeemed me, hallelujah. When I get up in the morning, hallelujah, if I don't have uh, uh, the right pair of socks uh, or if I go outside and uh, I've got a flat tire, he has still redeemed me. So he is still deserving of praise. Y'all getting the picture? So we do not base our praise upon when he's doing something for us present or some just answered prayer. That, that, that's not wisdom. That's not understanding. For well, God is always good. He saved me. He redeemed me. And that's why many times our blessings are held up so long because he would rather that we learn than to keep going around the circle of Israel. Isn't that right? So he keeps trying to get us to praise or whatever, this kind of thing. And I thank God for those of you that have learned that lesson. And you can say, ditto, amen. I know he's talking about pastor. But there may be some that don't really understand this. That I, for the life of me, I don't know why he keeps asking me to praise him when, when all of the things that's happening to me, it doesn't make sense. Is he crazy? I, I don't understand it. Does he care about me where I am? Somebody says, the just shall live by faith. 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 I'm talking to somebody right now. It's what the Lord is saying. You got to get out of the natural. Isn't that right? I got a list of things I'm just anxious to share. But the Holy Ghost is saying what he wants to say. <laughs> Hallelujah. As many as are. <laughs> That's why that meant something to me this morning because I feel like he must have been talking to me. God is good. He's so good. Oh, my God. 
it was so hard trying to learn to praise God because I couldn't seem to separate faith from feeling. But once I learned, praise was easy. Once I learned that, praise was easy. So the devil's on your track. So what? He's on everybody's track. <laughs> <laughs> but it does not change the goodness of God. He is so good. He is so gracious. He's got grace to spare. Every day you get up. Have you ever missed the mark and expected God to say something kind of tough to you and he just bless you? And you're thinking, okay, now I haven't, what did I do to deserve this? It's like he said, well, you still ain't getting it. I can't base it on your goodness because if I base it on your goodness, then you're going to get the praise or you won't give me the praise. So what you'll do is you'll keep trying to be good enough to get my blessing. And then when I say, well, I want my praise, you say, no, but I, I'm a good person. I deserve. Uh-oh, I touched somebody here today. today. I remember fasting and fasting. I felt real spiritual. And after the fast... After the fast, I got attacked. And my confidence went. Psh. <laughs> so he was trying to show me it's good to fast. But it's not based on that. It's good to pray. But it's not based on that. It's based on your faith and your trust in me. So. I can praise him right now. Can't you? Can't you praise him right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. He is so worthy. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Ah, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. You know what's so, so, so powerful is when you start praising God, your atmosphere change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Your atmosphere changes when you begin to praise God because if God's not in it, you'll come in it. Wherever true praise belongs or come, God belongs there. Isn't that right? The Bible says he comes to live in praise. Well, let me show you how he said God inhabits. That means to live, to dwell. Come to live in your praise. Oh, somebody need to praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mm, mm, mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bible says to Israel concerning Israel and when they began to thank and praise the Lord, God sent an ambushment. Angels came and dealt with their enemies. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody need God to deal with their enemies, but they, they, they hadn't yet learned to praise God. They, they still fussing. They still fussing. You can't bring that glory by fussing, isn't it right? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm talking to somebody here, but uh, I'll try to go easy here. But uh, praise will change your atmosphere. Remember, we're chosen. We're blessed. You're already blessed. You don't need nothing to change for you to be blessed. 
you are just as blessed as you need to be right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Because the Bible says in Galatians 2, 9, they that be of, 3, 9, they that be of faith are blessed, fortunate, prosperous, well off. That's what that word means. See, now you've been walking around with your head hanging down. But you don't have to no more. You've been chosen of God. Hallelujah. Like you remember how he chose David out of all of his brothers? It's the same concept. God looked at you and he chose you. He said, I want that one. I want that one. He knew before the foundation of the world that you would respond to the good news of God and he destined your future. Your future is carved out. You just got to walk in obedience now and walk in faith, isn't that right? Now, let, let's do this. Let, let's let all the worries and the concerns just fall off now because it's all useless. It's all useless. God says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it, complete it, finish it, continue doing it till the day of Jesus Christ. You still can praise the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. We've, we've been accepted. Means we were graced with grace. We were forgiven by the blood of Christ. Predestined. And we talked about sealed, which was a document indicating that or indicated that a document was genuine and are authentic. And then the seal was a seal of ownership. The devil says, you're not this, but God has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. And he knows your name. The Bible says God knows them that are his. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's that good shepherd. And all of his sheep are branded with the seal of the Holy Spirit. I want to pause now. Could you just pause and give God some thanks right now? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Sealed, sealed by God's spirit. Now, uh, can, I, can I say this to you? It, it, it's, it's, I just sense, feel like saying it. All this happened by your human effort, didn't it? Oh, it didn't. God did it, didn't he? Hallelujah. God did it, didn't he? You know, the Bible says when we were enemies, you know what an enemy is? Somebody that's in direct opposition to somebody. Somebody that'll hurt you if they could. The Bible says while we were enemies, Christ died for us. We weren't even, we were no kindred to God. We had no reason for God to love us. We were drowning in 
had no way to be rescued. But Jesus reached out his mighty hands. He saved us. We were headed for devil's hell. Headed for flames. And he saved us. He saved us. While we were enemies, he did this. He saved us, wrote our names in the book of life, put his spirit in us, called us children, called us sons. And the fact that he calls us son now we're kindred, right? Now we're family, right? Well, if while we were enemies, he, say, he, he died for us, what kind, of, what kind of love is that? How much more? Will he get us where we need to go if we're no longer enemies but family? And not only we're no longer enemies but we're children of God and we did not have the spirit of life in us but now we have the spirit of life in us imparted by the Lord. So all of this, he's blessed us, he's chosen us, he's predetermined our lives, those that would obey him. He's adopted us and then he sealed us with the seal of ownership so that we would be assured that the full payment was coming. Anybody read to praise him yet? Anybody read to praise him yet? He's good. Now in light of that, now in light of all of that, in light of all that, look at my says, time to walk. The walk. Time to walk the walk. Because the final aspect is to become warriors. Understanding what the will of the Lord is when it comes to spiritual warfare. And continue to fight the battles and to, to bring victory through Christ. He didn't just take the power and the authority from Satan to allow him to run rampant on the earth. And to keep defeating Christians. He didn't, he didn't defeat him for that reason. He defeated him and empowered us. So that we will continue to put him under our feet. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But we got to walk the walk. Isn't that right? Okay, turn to Ephesians 4 now. Don't anybody leave yet. We ain't finished. <laughs> so he says here. The believer is to first accept. Understanding what he's done for us. The disciplines. We must first accept the disciplines before we can engage in warfare like we should. Right. And become warriors. Must first accept the disciplines of unity. Somebody say unity. Purity. And forgiveness. All right, now, that's what he's talking about in chapter 4, okay? First 16 verses talks about unity. All right, now, I'll just, I'll just read a few verses. I'm going to see something right fast. Verse 1, chapter 4. I therefore, the prison of the Lord beseech you that you, what worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit, endeavoring to do what? Of the spirit in a bond of peace. Now, okay. Look at verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. 
And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, till we all come what? In the unity of the faith. All right, are you with me? And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man or mature man, somebody say mature, to the marriage of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right, now so he goes on that we henceforth be no more babies, infants, children tossed to and fro, right? Cared about with every wind of doctrine by the slave of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. Okay, so there's discipline in our speech, right? There's maturity in our knowledge and understanding, right? Then look at verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. All right. Bonnetus. Bricks and stones, when they're laid, do you see that white in the middle of the bricks? Okay. That holds them together, right? Now, without that, they can be together, but you could just take anything and just knock it right. It'll crumble because there's nothing to hold them, right? All right. Every believer has, through Christ, the adhesion or the cement, the mortar, to connect with others in the body as we allow him, the brick layer, to fit us in. Now, the brick layer did that, right? Or layers, several. They did that. If they had not done that, the bricks would be in a stack of maybe a thousand bricks on the sideline, right? It took the bricklayer to put them in position next to another. God has designed his body in the same way. We must allow the spirit of God to fit us in so that there be no schism or divisions in the body. If I've got schism and division in my soul, I'm not going to allow him to fit me in. I can have gifts and I can have a lot of knowledge, but if I don't have the wisdom and the humility and the ability so to submit to God, then I remain a wandering brick. Never entering into the divine purposes of God. You know, there are people who have been saved for many, many years. Can't tell them nothing. They know everything. But listen to this. This is what the Lord said to me. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 11. 411. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. God said to me while I was looking at that, he said, uh, 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 if believers don't accept and cooperate with his leadership, spiritual leadership, they can never come to the unity that he has in mind nor the maturity, nor, he said, properly, nor will, are they, will they be properly fitted in the body of Christ. 
That's what he said. So, so that's why God has designed leadership. So I say leadership. Spiritual leadership for his purposes, not their purposes, his purpose. God's purpose is to bring his body into the fullness of what he has in mind so that each joint can supply. Every gift must be functioning according to the will of God. That's when it's a healthy body. The body is healthy now because uh, every joint is, is working. Uh, what happens if, if, if my thumb, uh, let's say, if, if two of my fingers just... I can't bend them. You know, you know that happens sometimes. And, and so, well, let's say three of them. I got a little arthritis in my fingers. And so, and on both hands, I try to button up my shirt. I can't do it. Because there's arthritis in my fingers. The fingers need wholeness. The arthritis need to get out of the fingers so I can flex them again, right? What if, what, if, what if my hand is withered? What if my leg is withered? All these are part of my body, right? Am I happy without, can I just enjoy my life without or with a withered hand or feet? Oh, I can't. So we must provide care for one another. Isn't that right? Because if everybody is, if people are truly a part of the body, now listen, watch this now. If people are truly a part of the body of Christ, when they hurt and I ignore it, I'm hurting myself. Somebody said, Oof, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, 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 not. But that's what the Bible says. We're part of the same body. Isn't that right? So what happens is, down the road, I find out how I hurt myself. I may look good. It may feel like everything's going well. Oh, he need to, she need to get it together. But later on down the road, I find out just how I hurt myself by ignoring that part of my body. I hope you get what I'm saying today. But by love, serve one another. Isn't that right? But he said this. He said, uh, if believers don't accept and cooperate with spiritual leadership, he said, they can never come to unity, nor maturity, nor properly fit, be fitted in the body of Christ. So I says, I can't. I don't need a pastor. I heard one, one brother say, <laughs> this was funny. He said, a man told him, I don't need a pastor. It's true, but if God has designed it that way, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're trying to circumvent the wisdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And the struggles get worse, and the struggles get worse. One bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch. Isn't that right? Somebody may have had a bad experience with a pastor, but you can't lump all the pastors into the same category and say all pastors are bad. Isn't that right? It was God that designed pastors. Okay, Larry, what are you doing on this subject here? It was God that designed pastors. Remember the scribes and Pharisees? They said to Jesus, we know that you're a teacher come from God. Hypocrite. Because they were trying to catch him. Y'all remember that scripture? Trying to catch him. Talking about, we know you're a teacher come from God. Somebody said, if you know he's a teacher come from God, you better obey then. Isn't that right? <laughs> And scribes and Pharisees, but the point, let, let, the point that I'm making is that uh, God has God has prescribed a manner in which bringing us to the fullness of this oneness. Now, now look what He said. 
He said, verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you call it the one hope of the calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One, one, one. So, so who are they serving then? If you are serving him, who are they serving? Because it's one, 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 right? They can't get along with you. Or you can't get along with them. <laughs> All right, okay. Trying to make a point. The point is unity. Unity. So he said we must accept the disciplines of unity. Then he said purity. Verses 17 to 31. 17 said, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the futility of the mind. Are you with me? All right. So the mind plays a very important part in accepting, in allowing God to purify, right? Now look what he says in verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I beseech you therefore, Romans 12, 2, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing of the mind. Okay, bottom line, simply, simply put, what the Lord is saying is that there is the, the old man, there's a new man. The old man has his own education through the trials and the things that we've been taught according to this flesh. But then the new man needs to be educated with the word of God. So that means I must take my time educate myself to the spirit of God if, since my mind my thought life plays a very important part in my transformation process what are you thinking all the time what dominates your thinking most of the time is it thoughts of God the Bible says he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The mind. So purity. We educate ourselves renewed. So mental preparation is very important if we're going to allow God to purify us. Right? According to the word. Okay. Then he talks about forgiveness. And then he goes and talks about walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, chapter 5, which we read today. And he says three things, walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. Walk in love, first seven verses of chapter 5. We find that he says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and savor. And so he talks about this sacrificial kind of love uh, that Jesus loved sacrificially. So we find that if we're going to walk in love, we must learn sacrificing it will not always be convenient when we it comes to loving people 
it will not always be convenient. Sometimes it will be downright inconvenient. But sacrificial love is what we must grasp if we love in the example that he gave. And then he, so we follow Christ's example of love, and then we follow his example of holiness. And, I, and, and get this, what he says, uh, <clears throat> verse 6. After he gave these admonitions for three, he talks about uh, um, uh, living, we're not to live lives of sexual immorality or impurity or greed. Must not be joking, carrying, doing a lot of filthy joking and talking, obscenity or cursing. That's the old man, right? So he makes it very clear in this passage of here. Now, this is what he said. And I want you to tell somebody this. Verse 5 said, For this you know that no homonger nor unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, he makes this statement so emphatic. And then he says, Verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things come the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So we have a mandate, we have an obligation to tell people the truth. And so that they can understand. In other words, when he said, let no man deceive you. God, listen, God's standards cannot be replaced by permissive teaching. Those who teach otherwise are deceivers. So a lot of people talk about, well, you ain't got to worry about nothing, you know, and they want you to live any kind of way, but that's not according to the word of God. Jesus said, when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he said, teaching them whatsoever I've taught you, right? So we cannot just dismiss uh immorality and, 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 and things that people are doing that they shouldn't be doing. They, they need to understand that these things are not acceptable to God as a Christian. So what is partially wrong with the world today is that the church won't be the church. This is a real major problem today. So if the church won't be the church, it cannot function with the power and the authority that they were supposed to. Isn't that right? And not only are we to walk in love, but we are to walk in light. Truth, righteousness, and goodness. He said this fruit of the Spirit. So that means we must allow the Holy Spirit through us to bear fruit Right? Because the fruit of the Spirit is all these love, joy, and peace, and long suffering. Isn't that right? So we must uh, keep in step with the Spirit of God. So that He tells us how to do it. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that comes from the Spirit, is in all goodness. So to bear fruit, there has to be a union, a consistent union, right? So. If I'm in, in it today and out of it tomorrow, I can't bear the fruit. It's got to be a consistency in my relationship with God, right? And when there's a consistency, and when I begin to educate myself, the roots begin to grow and grow deeper and deeper in the soil of our hearts. And God and we begin to bear fruit because that of the Spirit of God in us. He's in us to bear fruit. He's in us to bear fruit, and he wants to bear fruit. But the fruit that the Spirit, well, I, I can't do, I can't bear, uh, what you say, envy, strife, and call that the Lord, right? Or call that the Holy Spirit. Because that's not the kind of fruit that he bears. It's in all goodness and all righteousness 
and it's according to truth. So the spirit of God. So we are walking the light, walk in truth. And light is what enables us to see things clearly and recognize evil for what it is, light. Walk in the light. Then he says walk in wisdom. Walking in wisdom is to walk circumspectly. What do you mean by walking circumspect? Walking careful and watchful and discreet, cautious, careful to consider all circumstances and possible consequences. So circumspectly, I walk in wisdom. You know, I, I, can, I, I think about things before I just up and do them. I ponder things. James said that there were those that says, Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to, this year I'm going down to Florida and I'm going to spend time there or I'm going out west there. I'm going to live down there for a few years and then uh, I'm going to get some of that gold out west and so on, you know, but just, just, just careless talking and doing. But walking in wisdom is to ponder, ponder the path of our feet and begin to think and, 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 and Run things by the Lord and talk to God and find out what's acceptable to him, right? Walking in wisdom. Walking in wisdom. Careful and to consider all circumstances and possibilities. Things are on my trail. If the enemy is on my trail, then I pause and I want to find out where the opening is. Carefulness and considerate. Circumspect, being aware of my surrounding, right? Y'all with me? Being aware of my surrounding, you know? And one of the things that I like about the, the men that have armor bearers, they send them to check out the surrounding. They don't just, the pastors and ministers don't just plunge into those things, especially when the churches grow and get larger. Satan has traps for, for the ministers, but, and, you know, that same uh, uh, concept is there with the president of the United States. He's, uh, you know, he, uh, there's, a, there's a watchfulness, and there are those the bodyguards and those people there. And, and uh, I know I ain't asking the armor bearer to do that, but the, 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 uh, these men that were around the president are, they're actually supposed to catch a bullet before they allow the president to get shot. But the point that I'm making is that we walk in watchfulness, circumspectly, being aware of our surroundings. Right? That's what he said, walking in wisdom. Okay. And then, then he mentions here, and I'm going to conclude with this, relationships must be in order. Are y'all with me? Wives, he said, we must submit to our husbands as unto the Lord. Well, I ain't going to Submit to this dude, he needs to, he need to get alive here. Well, is he a Christian? Supposed to be, but one lady says, one lady years ago, she said, submit to that? She said, God, you're going to have to do something here. So she went on a fast. She went on a fast and she fasted and prayed to God fixed that. She wasn't saying I'm not going to submit, but she said something's got to happen here. Something's got to happen in me. <laughs> So she went on a fast. Ladies, don't, 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 don't leave yet. I'm, I'm not finished. I, I got to talk, say about the men. Yet. 
But she went on a fast and God began to do something to her and that man. And she was able to do what she needed to do. So her submission signals her acceptance of God's institutional order in the family and the church. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. I can't stand her. Can't handle it. <laughs> the Lord says. <laughs> The Lord says, <laughs> okay, I, I need to get this out. <laughs> he said, husbands, love your wives. <laughs> love sacrifice itself. For the one it loves, he can love her sacrificially despite her imperfections, just as Christ did the church. He's to treat her with the same care that he would his own body. They must work together toward a complementary relationship characterized by love and respect, according to the African Bible Commentary. So as I was reading this, it was like, it was like, God, this is a bit more serious than I think we take this thing. As he was sharing, he says, people want to see how Christ loved the church. They want to see the model, how Christ loves his church, and is his church supposed to submit and respond to God. This is what he wants to bring the marriages into. And so that's why he labors to have the husbands to love their wives, and the wives see that. They reverence their husbands. This is not altogether easy, brothers and sisters, but with the intent of obeying God, this is first. There must be a full intent to please God in everything that is right in the sight of God. So that means he works on us until the Holy Spirit can bear the fruit that he intends for our lives to bear. Remember, the fruit is by the Spirit, not by us, right? So we draw near to God, and he'll draw near to us. The more we draw near to God, and God began to heal and to set free, and to deliver us by his divine power. So uh, I believe this is the crux. This has got kind of long today, but um, um, I wanted to emphasize the fact that we were chosen, and now the believer's walk is the important thing. Now, if I attempt to do a lot of warfare and I have not submitted to God, then it's going to cause some problems. Because the devil is a legalist. He's ready to point out every failure, every sin or disobedience. That's what he is. He's always accusing God's people before the Lord. For the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. So we purpose that we're going to live this Christian life, we're going to allow God to perfect our walk, and then he's going to move us into that warfare. Wow. We must, in conclusion, become his agents on the earth to extend the power of God and continually defeat Satan and all of his wicked attempts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. God has purpose for his church. And I want you to know that God has purpose for your lives individually and collectively. And he's committed to helping us get there. He's committed. So if you will bow your heads with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you and I give your name to glory. I give your name to honor. I thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for blessing us, adopting us. Thank you for predestining us, oh God, to be children of God. Thank you for sealing us, redeeming us, and sealing us. Thank you for these things. These were things that we could not do in our own selves. Thank you, Father. Now you will help us by your Holy Spirit to walk the walk in accord with your wisdom and your power and your love. I thank you. I give you praise. We can trust in your wisdom. We can trust in your Holy Spirit who is the agent to help us come to the fullness of what God has in mind. It is God the Father planned. It is God the Son redeemed. It is God the Holy Spirit that will empower our lives and purify our lives and bring us to the place of maturity by his divine power. And now we thank you Ask that you would minister the love, the grace, and the healing to our lives that we need. We thank you now. Everyone, please stand. We thank you. Give your name to glory and your name to honor. We've been chosen. We're chosen with a divine purpose in mind to extend the power of Jesus Christ victory that he wrought when he defeated Satan took away his authority and gave that power to his church his body now enable us now God to begin to mature and function to the capacity that you intend for us loosen wicked bands setting captives free casting out demons breaking and destroying the dominion of the enemy. But this is our purpose. This is your goal for the church. So we agree with God. We agree with the divine purposes of God. We're not floundering nor wandering, God. We are understanding better the purposes whereby you called us out of darkness into the kingdom of your son. sense of purpose to our lives and we'll understand the wisdom of God we thank you Holy Father bless now